Amen. Thank you, Roddy. God bless you, man. Wow. Well, a new year. A new year for Redbud Baptist Church. And we pray that uh, a lot will be accomplished with our building here. We were delayed, of course, with the weather on uh, getting much done with our uh, flooring area around the, the vestibule area. But uh, hopefully that will be fixed up and this will just be a... Uh, back to normal and uh, I, I guess you all have figured out if you do want to go to the restroom you have to go through either one of those doors and and uh, we please ask that you walk on the paper uh, it doesn't do any good to walk out those doors <laughs> but we're so glad to, to be able to be back in here aren't we amen our place of worship you uh, you like the uh, closeness that we had when we were in the fellowship hall and uh, uh, the church voted to put up some uh, ropes to kind of bring us in and uh, we'll we'll put those up again uh, Willard took them down he didn't get the word so but uh, <laughs> that's unusual Willard you usually have the word don't you but uh, we do uh, want to encourage us to just come in and uh, be a, a little closer to the front and it helps us as we sing and it helps us just uh, to experience and fellowship with one another. Well, I want you to uh, learn a verse if you haven't learned it already. It's Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. I'm going to say it and I, I think it's short enough, brief enough that maybe you can repeat it after me. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. I'll say it again, then we'll repeat it together. Trust the Lord with a whole heart and lean not to your own understanding. That's New King James. I keep wanting to say it in King James. But anyway, let's say it together. Trust the Lord with a whole heart and lean not to your own understanding. Now, one of the things about a new year, it's kind of a new start, isn't it? And as we think about this new year, I think the most important thing to do is where are you in Christ? There's no more important answer to that question than for you to be in Christ. You know, it's not all about you. Uh, some people get the idea, well, the world has to surround me, go around me. No, it's not about you at all. It's about him. It's about Jesus. And so it's important that here in the beginning of this year, you have a new chance to establish priorities. Jesus Christ needs to be your priority. What does it really mean to be a Christian? What does it really mean to be a Christian? I, I'm concerned about Christians in America today. I don't feel like we have any really good examples of what it really means to be a Christian. If you look out at most so-called Christians, you don't see much difference between them and the world. For some reason, I'm not hearing amens this morning. Is there something wrong with my mic or something? Or surely you're not feeling guilty yourself, are you? We ought to be different. We need to see examples of what it really means to be a Christian. To trust in the Lord with a whole heart. You know, many of the kings, if you study back, you know, in uh, the Old Testament about the different kings, there would be a commentary about a king, and it said, you know, that he trusted the Lord with a whole heart. That was a good king. If you will turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. John, chapter 2. We'll start with verse 23. John 2, 23. I hope that today you would have an idea about what it means to be passionate about Jesus. 
You know what it means to be passionate about something? It means to be sold out 100%. That is your passion. That is your focus. That is the direction you want to go. And Christians in America today, you and I, do not exhibit a passion for Jesus that the Bible talks about. John chapter 2 verse 23 it says now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover that's a crowded time isn't it? Let's stand together please. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast many believed in his name. Notice that it said many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. And believe there is the Greek word pistio. But it says in verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. But Jesus did not commit. That is again the same Greek word, pistio. He knew all men. Verse 25, and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Heavenly Father, may your word speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we have an occasion where many people saw the signs in which Jesus did. They got all excited. It was the popular thing to do. And they began to follow Jesus. But Jesus would not trust them. He would not trust them. I want to ask you a question today. Does Jesus trust you? Does Jesus trust you? So really, what, what is involved in that little word? Believe, commitment, to trust, to entrust. We have so many people who, well, I'm, I'm asked to do funerals, and I ask the family sometimes if it's someone I don't know, and that seems to be pretty common today that you're asked to do a funeral of someone who hasn't been in church in 50 years. and They say, well, oh yeah, he was a Christian. Back in 1938, he went to a Billy Graham crusade. Well, there's several things wrong with that statement, you know. Billy Graham wasn't even preaching in 1938, for one thing. But we're told things about people and uh, we're supposed to paint them a, a picture, you know. It's kind of like the the fellow, uh, they were twin brothers and one of them died and, and both of these guys were terrible. I mean, they were not faithful to their families. They were not faithful. They drank. They, they cursed. They did all kinds of things. But one twin came to the preacher and said, I'll give $10,000 to the building project if you will say he was an angel. Would you believe that preacher took the $10,000? The church needed it for the building pretty bad. And as the preacher was preaching the funeral, he said, compared to his brother, he was an angel. <laughs> but I, I'm afraid so many people have the wrong idea. They just, uh, I, I, really, I really can't even comprehend what is going on in their mind. They, they, they think if, as long as, oh yes, there is a God. I believe there is a God. No following him. No naming him. No studying him. No loving him. No passion for him. And yet they think heaven is theirs. Now that's kind of what Jesus is telling us here. It's not just enough to to know. It's not just in the head. It's got to be in the heart. Trust the Lord with a whole heart. Amen? It's uh, kind of like uh, over here in the book of Luke. Uh, 
uh, chapter 8, it talks about the sower and the seed. You're familiar with, with that, aren't you? Uh, Jesus told a parable about a, a sower. He, he sowed some and f some fell on the wayside and it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock and it soon, uh, as it sprang up, it, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground. And that sprang up and yielded a crop of a hundred fold. Now, the disciples want to know what that meant. And so verse 11, he, Jesus describes, now that the crowd is gone, he tells his disciples, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. And those by the wayside are the ones who hear then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock, that is the seed on the rock, are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. There's head knowledge, remember. Remember. Now the ones in verse 14, nor the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Who does that sound like? But the ones that fell on the good grounds are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Where are you? You know, it's great. Uh, I, I can recall some great revival services at different churches I've attended and, and even to, to preach some. I mean, when it just seems like heaven comes down. Many people come forward. Many people come and say they want Jesus as Savior. Then when it comes to being baptized, we, we can't find all of them. And then among those that are baptized, uh, it seems like when we start saying, okay, it's very important that you go to Sunday school. It's all very important that you have time in Bible study. And the number is less. And we say something about it's important that we have visitation. And the number is less. It's important that we have prayer meeting on Wednesday night and we gather together as a church and pray. And where are they? We talk about outreach. We talk about tithing. And it seems like they're gone. They were so excited at the revival. They were so excited with the evangelists there. Why, we have standing room only almost. We have to get Brother Dick to take the fire marshal out and get him drunk so he won't shut us down, you know. <laughs> it's exciting. But where are they on Wednesday night? Where are they when it comes time of service to the Lord? Well, What is standing between us and a wholehearted commitment to the Lord? You know, Jesus told different people different things on how to be saved. Did you know that? One person comes to him and he says, repent. Another man comes to him and he says, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Different things to different ones. Be born again. Which literally means to be born from above. Why did he say different things to different people? What he was talking about 
is whatever is standing in your way of a wholehearted commitment to me. That's what you need to get rid of. I know a lot of you think, well, if I got rid of that, I wouldn't have any joy in life. Folks, you haven't experienced joy in life until you get a hold of the Lord with a whole heart. Two kinds of commitment, head and heart. Do you have the real thing? There was a little boy that heard the circus was coming to town and uh, didn't have much in the way of money, so he did some errands in the neighborhood and did a little work mowing grass so he could get enough money to go to the circus. So he got his money, he was able to get some tickets, and he walked to town, and there was the crowd, they were all lined up, and he made his way, it was tough getting there, but he made his way to the street curb, and he saw the parade. He saw the elephants and the horses, different animals, monkeys in a cage. He turned around, threw his tickets down, went home thinking he saw the parade, I mean the circus, but he, all he saw was the parade. He didn't have the true experience, did he? He really didn't get into the, what it was all about. There's a lot of difference between a parade and the actual circus. He missed it. I think the parable of the sower kind of tells us the same story. There's some that just plain miss it. They don't really get in there with a whole heart. They don't know what it means to be passionate about Jesus. Anyone who stopped, anyone who didn't let the word mature in their life, simply didn't have it to start with. Over in 1 John chapter 3, that's the, that's the one that's just before Revelation, you know, and 2nd and 3rd and Jude. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. He who sins, and this is talking about willful, habitual sin, he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The reason Jesus came was to destroy that work of the devil. And verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not habitually sin. Now John admits in 1 John that we sin. He says if you, if you don't admit you're, uh, that you sin, you're a liar. But here he's talking about that ha habitual, willful sinning. And then he goes on to say, for his seed, that is the, the, the precious implanting of God's Holy Spirit, remains in him, mean, meaning a Christian, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. We are not held, our sin is not held against us when we have been born of God, born from above. Isn't that wonderful? We're free of that punishment of sin. We can be secure in that. It doesn't mean we have to come and get saved all over again every time we do fall into sin. But I want you to know that there's people, and I don't know it's because of, they call themselves Baptists or what, but, but they abuse that. And, and I believe they're lost because they abuse that. They think, all right, I'm, I'm free of sin because I am a so-called Christian. And they just live a life that is against the Word of God. 
There is no love of Jesus. There is no being passionate about him. You see, I sin all I want. Because I, I don't want to sin. You understand that? I don't want to sin. I don't want to be willfully, habitually sinning. But I will admit to you, I, I have told some stories. Every time the computer asks me about a new upgrade, it says, have you read and understand and obey this particular statement? And I hit yes. I lie because I don't want to read all that stuff. <laughs> I bet you do too. The last guy that read all that's crazy. It's great to know that Jesus loves us so much that he saved us despite our terrible condition that we had. But did you know the Lord, some people, I don't know, they don't seem to understand it. They, they seem to think the Lord wants quantity instead of quality. But you know, the Bible repeatedly shows us examples that it's the other way. The Lord wants quality. He wants quality. Excuse me. You know, Jesus often escaped from the crowd. And when he talked with somebody, he always looked deep into their heart looking for that quality of being passionate about him, serving him with a whole heart. The Bible has many examples of the, the Lord wanting just quality. Remember when Gideon uh, was going to go into battle, he had thousands who were ready to go. But the Lord said, no, I, I don't get any glory in that. And so he ha had a test for them and they went to the water to drink. They were all thirsty. And some, boy, they just went in there and, and just slapped down in the water. They, they just gobbled it up. And some very carefully scooped up the water as they looked around for the enemy. And the Lord said, that's the ones you want. Gideon's 300. Out of, out of, could have been thousands, but only 300. The Lord just wanted quality. He did not want quantity. And look at Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed this, this whole two-city situation. Saved only Lot's family, save his salty wife. Some of you didn't catch that. But just, just that one family was saved out of all those people in Sodom and Gomorrah. God wants quality. Remember Abraham said, well, what if there's, what if there's a... A ten or two, you know, he kept giving a countdown on that. God wants quality. Did you know when, when Jesus had the big crowd and, and he fed them, he fed 5,000. But when it was just to preach, you know, only 500 showed up. When he said, we're going to have a special prayer meeting, it was 120. When it was, uh, we're going to go out and visit, they went out two by twos, there's only 70. When it was a, a matter of 12 that were going to be devoted followers and learning of him, 12, yeah. And of the 12, he, he said, I, I, I want to pray about a life or death matter. Only three. James, John, and Peter. But when it came to the cross... When it came to that work that he gave on the cross, how many were there? It wasn't the 5,000 that he fed or the 500 that heard the preaching or the 120 that prayed or the 70 that visited or the 12 that became disciples or the three, only one, John. John. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the only one that was at the foot of the cross. Why was John 
treated special. Uh, you know, John was the, the one that had the privilege of writing the wrap-up gospel, the gospel that filled in the gap. It wasn't any of the synonymous gospels uh, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke that have some of the same stories. He picked different stories. He picked different examples. He was the one that made it so very clear of the way of salvation and gave us John 3.16. He was on the island of Patmos and, and God gave him that special, special vision that we know as revelation. Many times John was right there with Jesus. Why was John special? More so than the 5,000 that he fed or the 500 they just heard preaching or the 120 that prayed or the 70 that went visiting of the twelve or the three because John cared John loved John was passionate about Jesus that's the difference in John we need more Johns to be examples to us today in our world and in our time Trust in the Lord with a whole heart and lean not to your own understanding. You know, Jesus is passionate about you. Do you know that? As we start 2016, I pray that we would be passionate about Jesus that we really would get excited about our service to Jesus. If you really want to have joy, real joy, wonderful joy, <laughs> just let Jesus come into your heart. Amen? Fill him with all that you've got. Well, what does it mean to be a real heaven-born from above Christian? It's just simply being passionate about Jesus, loving Jesus, loving his word, loving his church. He died for his church. And lean not to your own understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we look into 2016, that with all of our heart, we would be about loving you and serving you not out of some need that we feel in order to be saved for we know you have given to the, that to us that we did not deserve by grace but that Lord because we love you Lord it may mean that we might be needing to do less because maybe that hasn't been what we've been doing what you would have us to do we know that you are the one who has a plan for our life and you have a plan for us in 2016 you have a plan for us as individuals and as a church and may we just get a hold of that by loving your word and studying your word and being faithful to you and to one another Lord as we have this invitation time we just pray that this would be a time of a recommitment. A recommitment by members of this church to you. And Lord, if there's one here without Jesus, we pray they would come and receive this Lord who loves them so much that he went to the cross for them. Lord, thank you for dying in my place. What I deserved, you did for me. I love you, Jesus. For in your name we pray. Amen. We have this time of invitation. As we stand together, I pray you would come. Whatever that need, most of all, to follow Jesus. Precious salvation. And you know, if you, if you are saved, why well, you definitely need to follow him in the first command he gave you, and that's to be baptized. Why would someone who really loves Jesus deny 
what he asked him to do. We haven't drowned anybody yet in that baptistry. We haven't. But people have walked out of that baptistry knowing they've done what Jesus told them to do with joy in their heart. What, I don't know what the Lord laid upon you. Maybe it's just a prayer request today. But why don't you follow some of the others as they come in to this altar and pray. And let's give him 2016, okay? You come as we sing. Have thine own way.